So we wanted to share with you our experience uh, this morning of taking uh, an extension program that was taught entirely outdoors in a field setting and turning some of it into an online course to create a, a hybrid course to maximize impacts and efficiency. And so at first thought, it's kind of a crazy idea. Um, it was several years that I thought online courses as part of the Utah Master Naturalist program was the worst idea ever until about <laughs> one and a half years ago. I saw what we could do with Canvas through extension and, and decided to, to take a big leap of faith. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on the Utah Master Naturalist program. Um, it is a USU Extension program, and for Extension here at USU, online courses is a relatively new idea. Um, there's the pesticide applicator training that's largely online. Um, there's now online gardening programs as part of the Master Gardener program. And so this is kind of the third program to, to really um, integrate online courses. It's a statewide curriculum. We have three different field courses that focus on Utah's major environments, uh, watershed investigations, so rivers, streams, wetlands, Great Salt Lake, desert explorations. Most of our state is desert, so there are plenty of places to teach that, and mountain adventures. We teach that in the Wasatch, the Uinta Mountains, out in the Great Basin Mountains. Um, and this program is really successful through partnerships with other organizations around the state. Uh, for instance, I work with Utah's Hogle Zoo to teach a couple of these courses every year, and their staff and their experts at the zoo are great resources to help this program spread. Um, unlike the Utah Master Gardener program, this is a centrally administered program. I kind of control the whole thing and what goes on around the state rather than county chapters like is common with master gardener programs. Okay, so we've had a lot of successes over the years. We have, actually this number has gone up. We have over 500 certifications in the past 12 years. Um, and about 13% now have completed all three of these field courses. Uh, participants can choose to do one, two, or all three, whatever interests them or applies to their, their job or their volunteering. Um, last year, I revised all three of the course manuals. They're each about 100 pages long. It's basically the textbook of the program. And it's a financially self-sustaining program. We try not to make profits in extension. We try to break even. It's really important to recover costs and and ensure that a program doesn't require funding from administration to, to be successful. Um, we've integrated into other training programs. Cottonwood Canyons Foundation uh, has naturalists that they use for snowshoe hikes to teach students or ski with a ranger. We've integrated the Mountain Adventures uh, training program into their naturalist training. And so we've been adaptable with a lot of different organizations to use Master Naturalist to help work best for them rather than just doing it the way I usually do. Um, we've had a lot of collaborations with other faculty around the university as well. One thing we've found through pre and post testing over the past decade or so is that there are significant increases in knowledge as a result of, of participating in a Utah Master Naturalist course. I used to do pre and post tests. The first thing they would do is take a test. The last thing they would do is take the same test again. In my uh, audience, the general public, this tended to freak them out because they thought they were going to get graded or they may not get the certificate if they did poorly on the, the test. And so over the years, I've changed the methods that I use. Now I've gone to retrospective uh, post then pre-testing, where at the very end I say, what do you think your knowledge level is in these subjects now? And then the same thing, but what do you think your knowledge level in these subjects was when you started the course? That way they're just self-reporting, it's pretty low pressure, but it still is a reliable measure of knowledge. We have positive short-term impacts. At the end of a 
Utah Master Naturalist course, they get a, a standard evaluation. We have 14 different statements related to um, their, their, how the program inspired them, what they're planning on doing as a result of participating in the program. And um, we have fantastic evaluation results overall. Um, the three different color bars are for the three different field courses. Um, and over the years, we've looked at these results and noticed that some of them are a little bit lower than others, and so we make very targeted improvements to those parts of the program and then reevaluate in future years, and we actually see increases. So evaluation has been a really important tool for this program. We also have lasting long-term impacts. In 2014 and 2017, I uh, sent out a long-term evaluation survey, and on average, the respondents had taken a uh, Master Naturalist course four years prior, some upwards of 10 years prior to receiving the survey. And we had a bunch of different measures uh, that focused on what their uh, intentions were and also some of the actions that they participated in as a result of a Utah Master Naturalist course. Um, and overall, we saw them positive. The, the response is positive. The, the responses that are, are lower are actions. And what we know is that intentions can be high, but it's not necessarily translated to action. Um, and so one thing that we're working on is actually um, promoting, participating in those actions during the courses and doing a better job of quantifying what they were at the time and then what what they are in the future. So when, we've also had some limitations with the Utah Master Naturalist program. There's a limitation on courses every year. Traditionally, there were five-day field courses, usually Monday through Friday, nine to five, some evening activities, and it's a lot of time for participants. Uh, it's a lot of time for instructors. It's really limited the uh, number of partner organizations we can work with because they have to devote a lot of their staff time to this program, to, to offering uh, the program. The number of participants in this bar chart has been increasing, but increasing very slowly. And so we needed to do something that would increase the slope of that, that over the years to make it increase a little bit faster. Um, one of the other things you'll notice in this map of where we te have taught uh, Utah Master Naturalist courses, we're missing pretty large areas of the state and large population centers like the Provo area, St. George, out in Vernal. And so we just weren't able to find partners to, to help us reach those areas. So we thought about a hybrid format for the Utah Master Naturalist program. Um, some of the benefits, of course, are anyone who has a compute, access to a computer or a smartphone can participate. The Canvas app is actually pretty good um, for, for going through a course on your phone. And we thought of what are some of the benefits of shorter field courses. It would be less intimidating for instructors. It's, it's hard to for a lot of uh, partners to have staff who they felt have the level of expertise who could coordinate and lead a five-day field course. And it's also less time in general for the instructors and the participants. Uh, so one thing I did uh, back in 2016 as part of the program evaluation, I asked the master naturalists if they would even be interested in online courses. Would they prefer reading the manual plus doing a five-day field course, which is what we were doing, reading the manual, doing an online course, and having a three-day field course, or just reading the manual and doing an online course? I didn't expect very many people would be interested in that, but I threw it in there just to see. Um, and I let people choose any of those choices. Um, and what I found was that many people said, you know, I'd be willing to give it a shot doing an online course and a shorter field course. And some of the open-ended responses showed that they could go either way. And so I thought, okay, well, the idea of an online course and a shorter field course is not 
a terrible idea to people who just completed a five-day field course. Um, and then I set out to do a little bit of research, mostly in the Journal of Extension, to see if online uh, courses or hybrid courses can work for extension programming. And what I found was that they can complement or even substitute for extension programs effectively. Uh, they eliminate the barriers of travel and timing, which were some of the same barriers that we were dealing with. People just couldn't get to a course, so they couldn't devote time off of work or away from their family. And people enjoy self-directed free time learning um, rather than being uh, set to a schedule for the entire time. So at this point, we thought, OK, online courses or hybrid courses for the Utah Master Naturalist program could work. And that's where Jen comes in. <laughs> All right. Uh, so as Mark kind of talked about, um, these online courses provided a way to engage more people. And as we first started out, um, it was kind of intimidating. There were lots of different ways that we could go about this. But eventually, we decided on some course objectives. and. That, that took us a little longer than we anticipated for mm -hmm. some reason. But we decided on course objectives, which led to our module topics, and which led to different learning activities within those modules. And then now, Mark can kind of assess whether those um, learning object objectives have been met. And so can the students. So if you forget anything else today, just remember, set your course objectives. And that is the key. Um, and then I, I thought it was really important when developing this that we keep the learning theories that have been really popular, well, I guess I shouldn't say popular, but effective <laughs> in Mark's field courses. And so that was kind of a key, key element, but it took a lot of thinking outside the box. Because as you know, with, or, or maybe you don't know, but environmental education um, happens best when you're learning out in the field and really engage with the material. And so we ended up creating activities and discussions and different modes of learning, similar to what Dr. Tobin talked about a little bit today, to incorporate into the, the online portion of the course. And so then that would create kind of this community of learners that could then transition to the field course. And so I think, and Mark will talk about this a little bit more, but it's been quite successful. And that's exciting. So think outside the box when you're developing your future, I guess, activities and discussions. Um, and then the, another thing that was really important as we um, got developing this course was um, that we designed not only for the students, but we also designed for Mark and whoever will teach his courses. And um, as long as you design for the students, you design for you, you're going to have a really good effective design. And it might be a little bit intimidating as you start out because there's so many options you can go, especially if you um, are using Canvas, which you probably will be at, at USU. But um, yeah, uh, one thing that Mark had seen at a conference was a certain display that he really liked for the course. And so that was really helpful for getting us started. And, um, but yeah, there's lots of, different, lots of different methods you can try. Um, one element of online education that I've learned is that simple is good. So if you're just getting started, uh, think simply. I know Dr. Tobin talked about today how it's important to write everything down. So write it down, brainstorm it, and um, ask your colleagues. Uh, see what other professors have done, what other classes look like, and then you can start to incorporate um, more technology and more advanced ways of learning that Dr. Tobin also talked about today. Um, I showed you this awesome picture because this is on my wall in my office. Mark's probably seen this. Um, and usually people who come in and see this on my wall are like, what is that? But uh, this was really helpful for designing the online course because it helped me map it out. And I could see where the students would link to. And it has all of our um, learning objectives in the form of our modules and 
the different steps that students could take on those modules. So if all else fails, sketch a map, post it on your wall, post it notes. Um, and yeah, let's see. Oh, another really important part of the online courses is that we take students through the steps of Bloom's taxonomy. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but these are just stages of learning um, that basically lead students to more advanced thinking about the topics. And we chose to do this within our modules and also within the course as it goes along, as students increase more and more um, knowledge about the overall topic. And uh, just simply as a rundown, our module pages have an explore, understand, connect, and reflect and expand section. And you can kind of see with explore that we introduce the topic and that's similar to um, students remembering what they might know about the topic currently and just kind of gets their brain engaged a little bit more. And then understand we, we've offered opportunities for students to read the course material or the manual that Mark talked about, and then watch videos. Um, Mark and I have had a chance to make a few videos, some that are entertaining and, mm -hmm. and really fun for the students. And then also um, listening to podcasts or uh, Utah Public Radio and different outside material. And that's just basic ways to understand and gives the students different modes of learning. And then as far as connection, we've designed discussions and activity activities that get students kind of engaged with it and they can apply it and analyze the topic and the materials. And then Mark talked about the quizzes, I think, maybe, or maybe yes. it was a survey. Our new assessments, yeah. Yeah, and we have like these really low stakes five point quizzes, and which is kind of funny because sometimes when students get things wrong, we'll get an email. Wait, what, why is this answer wrong? But mm -hmm. anyway, they're meant to be super low stakes. Mm -hmm. Just so students can kind of see where they're at and um, also Mark can see where they're at when he takes them out and does like the three-day field course and he kind of knows everybody's um, mm -hmm. engagement level with the material. And then um, the expand, we have a section on there that just gets, gives maybe more intense, detailed information on the topic, which gets students kind of creating more of a learning for and a drive, a drive for knowing more, I guess. So. Um, this, this is just an example of some of the, I guess, student work that we've had thus far. Um, it's kind of fun to incorporate different learning theories into the courses. And then we have had awesome activities, which students usually tend to like, and uh, we get some of this work. So a little bit of literary, a little bit of art, and we try to incorporate a bunch of different things in. Um, a really important thing to remember as you're starting out is that consider your, you should consider your first course kind of a usability test because it's, it, it really is just a, a leap of faith, like Mark said. And then survey your students. I know Mark's really great about surveying and getting results and adjusting, and I think that's been the key, and it's been really helpful for me on my end because then I can take that information, change activities, do do certain adjustments to the online course, and it's really helpful. So, oh yeah, this is kind of an example of our homepage that I wanted to show you. We use a lot of visual engagement, and these different pictures represent different modules as the students um, click on them. They take them to different areas. And as you roll your cursor over each image, the title pops up. You just can't show it in a no. screenshot, really, so. <laughs> But are they locked? I think you have to complete the first one yeah. to unlock the second one, the third one. Because sometimes our first students would jump to the most interesting one, and then they'd have to go back and learn the basics that we really wanted them to know. First yeah, time, so. which was not very helpful when we're following Bloom's taxonomy. Because right. we wanted people to learn from the beginning and continue throughout the course. So, and then this is a little bit outdated, but this is um, a picture of one of the modules, and you can see how we have the different steps that are outlined there, and then today we have a nice banner picture, and then we also have embedded our videos so students can see more 
visual engagement on each page. All right, so um, what we did was we applied for and received a grant from USU Extension for 18 months to, to basically pay for Jen's time to do the bulk of the legwork, um, turning these courses into hybrid courses and developing the online portions. We began with desert explorations for a few reasons. One, it's one of the hardest field courses to teach. It often recurs in fairly remote areas and it's harder to get people to. So we wanted to, to try that one first. Um, Oregon Master Naturalist is the only other hybrid, hybrid Master Naturalist course in the country, and so they gave us access to their um, program, their online courses. We were able to see what they do, um, choose the things we liked, not do the things that we didn't like, like voiceover PowerPoints. <laughs> um, and we developed a great new partnership with the Natural History Museum of Utah. They had just ended a big program training teachers, um, and they wanted a new program to train teachers. And so this was a great opportunity for us to uh, work with them to bring our program to their teacher training program and, and help both organizations out. Um, Jen mentioned videos. We started a YouTube channel and uh, Jen is also really awesome at filming and editing videos. Um, a three minute video though takes about what, three or four <laughs> days of work. But one thing I've started doing is whenever I'm out hiking and I see something cool like a rare plant, I just pull out my iPhone and do a one minute selfie video. I think about it for a few minutes. And then my challenge is to just whatever happens in the first or second take, that's what it is. It's not perfect, but it's a great opportunity to just show somebody something cool and help them realize that sharing things with others doesn't have to be perfect. Just give it a shot. Um, so. so Jen records the videos? Yeah, so Jen films the videos except the selfie videos. I just use my phone and... And I, sometimes I'll have a little microphone that I'll just plug in for better sound. Um, so yeah, we do both options for videos. And they've turned out great. This is actually an old photo. We have a lot more views than is on this. Um, so when, as we had teachers go through these online courses, these hybrid master naturalist courses, we wanted to do a lot of evaluation to see how effective they are. Um, and so, again, the three different color bars are the three different uh, online courses. And in terms of teaching the participants content, the, the teachers found, well, I should mention that we started out with teachers partly also because they're brutally honest. If you're ever looking for a group of people to test something with, an educational material, teachers are great because they will tell you in a heartbeat what they don't like about it. Um, they'll tell you what they do like, and that just gives you a great opportunity um, to see how well it's working. So the, the teachers found that the online course gave them basic understanding. Uh, the online materials were informative and interesting, and the course, online course increased their interest in these different ecosystems. Um, in terms of functionality, the teachers enjoyed learning on their own time. Uh, the course was easy to navigate, which was one of the most important things. We didn't want them lost in the, in the Canvas course. Um, and the different activities that we had them do uh, helped them understand the content. Um, between the activities and the discussions, you know, you'll notice the bars aren't quite as high. We had this, this really big split between people who really love the discussions and we would try and get them out to do an activity, come back and report what they saw. But then there were also teachers who thought, well, I didn't really have time for this. Or some people would say, I'm not going to respond to um, one of the, the comments in the discussion, which we usually require, because they just felt like it was forced. And I, I would say, okay, we'll just do it however you want to do it. It's, it's really for them rather than for me. Um, and then lastly, overall teachers agreed that they felt like they were part of a community of learners.
by starting out in this online course. One of the first activities we have them do is introduce themselves and say a little bit about who they are, where they're from, what they're interested in doing in this course. Um, and then what we wanted to also know was how well did the online course complement the field course, the three-day field course that they did later on. And so at the end of the field course, part of the evaluation was uh, understanding how well they worked together, what the transition from online to field course was like. And overall, we got um, great feedback. The transition was seamless. The online course prepared them well for the field course, uh, gave them the knowledge that they needed to begin learning in the field and reinforcing what they know. Um, they were excited to apply what they learned in the online course to our, our adventures outdoors. And they felt like they already knew a lot of the people. Usually in the field courses, before they were hybrid, it would take a day or two for people to relax, get to know each other, become comfortable, and actually start learning. And I got one of the best comments I've ever gotten. Teachers use Canvas a lot, either in their classes or in their professional development. And one teacher said that it was the only Canvas course they've ever liked. So that was, <laughs> that was pretty nice feedback. Um, and we've seen a huge spike in participants and courses this year with three-day field courses. I discovered I could teach three three-day field courses in a two-week span, which is really busy, but it's possible. And so we have a lot more partners in the map. The purple pins are new courses this year. We're working with uh, Duchesne and Uinta County Extension and the Ute Indian Tribe to offer a, a course, a mountains course up in the Uintas. Um, we split one mountains course that was in Salt Lake and Great Basin National Park into two. Um, we now have our first deserts course in St. George. So, all of a sudden, organizations said, hey, we can, we can help you with a three-day course, or this looks like something that, that we can manage now. So that's been a great impact. So in conclusion, um, hybrid courses, uh, even though I thought they were a bad idea just a couple of years ago, they've actually worked really well for Utah Master Naturalist. They've helped us actually be better at meeting our program's goals and missions. Um, participants were excited. I get a lot of people at the start of a field course or at the middle of a field course say, you know, I really enjoyed learning about some of this stuff ahead of time, so that way when we're outdoors, we can really apply and reinforce our knowledge. Um, we'll be continuing to evaluate and improve the courses. I go back through the quizzes and I see how many people got what questions correct? If nobody got a question correct, then I say, well, did I word it poorly or is it just too hard? Um, if it's too hard, that's okay because it's not a good assessment if everyone gets all of the questions right. Um, but most importantly, our hybrid courses have allowed us to increase the reach of the program, both geographically um, with new partner organizations and um, reaching more rural and underserved audiences. So if you'd like to read more about this, we have an article in the latest issue of the Journal on Empowering Teaching Excellence, or we'd be happy to chat with you at any point. You can contact us if you want to learn a little more detail about what we've done. So thanks. We have We have a little time for a few questions. Chuck. Hey, uh, Mark, uh, yeah. what about the online portion? Is that a, uh, uh, doesn't appear to be an open access thing. What is the timing of that uh, so that you get these together as a community? Is that an issue? Yeah. Because uh, uh, that is then somewhat restrictive. Right. It's not open access. What we usually do is we give them access one month before the start of the field course. And some people get on it right away. Most of them do. Some people leave it until the last week. And so um, one thing that we found with the teachers that we piloted with, we started out giving them two weeks. And they complained that that was not enough time. I got a lot of complaints about that. So <laughs> 
we give them one month now, and it's worked really well. You know, some people still just won't do the online course. Every once in a while, we'll get some someone, and that's fine. You know, we this is not a captive audience. The vast majority of people are not taking Utah Master Naturalist courses for credit, just for their personal enjoyment. And so, I'm fine being flexible, but. If I make it sound like it's required, then they're pretty good at doing it. Do, do they get to keep access afterwards? Yep. After they've completed this, so they can go back and rewatch. Yep, there's no end date to the Canvas courses. And we have a, with a lot of teachers, they like to then show their students the videos, and they've really appreciated that. <coughs> Russ? Uh, two questions. You're very organized with your evaluation results. Uh-huh. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I guess this is kind of that question, but do you, on your, do you just have an Excel file where you track that each year? How, how do you, what format do you use to document those impacts? Yeah, I mean, usually I just, whenever I want to do some analysis, I just download the data from Qualtrics and spend a lot of time staring at a big spreadsheet and sorting it by course or by year and extracting data. Um, but in terms of the organization of the evaluation really it just goes back to the course objectives and the course goals because the questions in the assessments or in the evaluations are just restatements of the goals and objectives of the course. And so, those don't change too much year to year. You can just have one file I'm guessing with each yeah. year's results. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes they, the evaluations need to change because I'm not asking the right questions. That's one thing about evaluation is you get, you see your results, and then you re I realize that I'm not asking these other questions, and so I'll add those or change. So it's just kind of a never-ending process. <laughs> Did you have a second the last question? One I had was sure. About the discussion, so I do that in my classes. Mm -hmm. Teach the upper level undergraduate course, communicating sustainability, and in the discussions, they aren't allowed to see what anyone else posts until they post their own. Do you have that set up in yours, or can they just see what people are writing and then? Yeah. Okay. I, we don't restrict it that way. Okay. Um, we do ask them to post and reply to someone else's post. Okay. And it works relatively well. And I try and be engaged. Sometimes I can't because I'm doing so many other things. And one thing that's been nice to realize is that if for some reason I can't be very engaged in the discussions, they almost don't notice. They just work together and interact with each other, and then we do the field course. So, Mark. So, you just raised something interesting in response to somebody's question. You have got now at least three different audiences. Oh, yeah. You have, you have people who are just taking it because they want to take it. Mm -hmm. You've got teachers who are taking it for, to step up on the salary schedule. You've got graduate students, people like me, send. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does that does that interaction create you know challenges or is that does that sort of work seamlessly where no matter why they're there they seem to to function um, similarly? How does how does that go? It works overall pretty well. Um, that's been from the very first day of the Utah Master Naturalist program twelve years ago, thirteen years ago. That's been the number one challenge that I've had to really work toward um, solving. And one thing that's great about the online courses is that we can start to see, okay, who's starting with really limited knowledge in biology or ecology and can give them a little bit more attention, uh, particularly in the field courses. You know, as an aside, explain some basic ecological concepts to them so they understand desert ecology better. And so it takes a lot of flexibility. Um, but it's fun because then you start getting the graduate students teaching the general public members in the courses or the teachers talking about how excited they are to teach their students about something we're doing in the field course. And so to me, it's really fun having a diverse audience in the courses. And sometimes we'll have funding to just offer courses to teachers, um, which works well because then teachers from similar grade levels can work together. So, yeah. One more question. 
Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask, so it sounded like with the, um, the online course being to some extent optional, I was just curious how you set up your discussions and kind of if you saw the people who were accessing it a full month out, if generally the discussions were kind of um, overwhelmingly just those people interacting with each other, or if you did get more interaction between kind of the different groups you were serving. Yeah, um, there's usually a group of at least half of the participants who start right away and are really engaged. The people who tend to come on later don't get as much interaction because a lot of people have already completed it. And so I'll actually go in and I'll interact more with them. I'll see whose posts have gotten no responses and I'll add some replies to their posts. And so I try and be the person that connects them help them feel like they're engaged with the group, so. Well, thank you both of you yeah. for Thanks. Thank you.